And here we are, coming to you almost live. It's not quite live, just a, just a little bit live. This is almost live, Pastor Mike, and I am almost live, and I am almost online. I am online with you today. Um, I am recording this a little bit early, as many of you know. I've talked about I'm going to be having surgery on uh, May the 20th. And I will be in an undisclosed, undisclosed location somewhere in Tampa, Florida. I don't even know where it is. We haven't been there yet. Uh, but anyway, I um, after I did the program on Thor's Day, um, people, here's what I like. Here's what I like about um, this ministry, about the software that we use the pure bible search if you don't have that for linux windows or macintosh computers purebiblesearch.com download it use it start pressing buttons if you don't know how everything works you're not going to ruin the software unless you know how to code uh but anyway download but here's what i like about that people will people will be watching and looking and reading their bible they will be studying things they will be counting things in their Bible. This is how this all came about. Last Thursday's program was about counting and getting wisdom from that. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number. I know it says the number of the beast at number 603 score and six. Solomon said, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, he was looking for wisdom. He said, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. And so I just, I, years ago, I just started counting things in the Bible. Well, that's kind of, it's kind of spread a little bit. People are counting things in the Bible. And this lady was counting the decorations that were on the candlestick in um, Exodus chapter 25. We're going to look at that. Uh, we're going to revisit that. Because what happened was when she started counting things, some things made sense to her. She sent it to me. I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, that's pretty awesome. That is pretty stinking awesome. So I talked about it on Thursday, <clears throat> put it out on the internet and people can choose to believe it if they want to or not believe it if they want to. They can go and verify it if they want to. They can go and open up a King James Bible and count it just the way that we did. So anyway, put it out there and people are sending me stuff about what they're seeing. Now, a guy sent me this uh, that I'm going to show you today. And it's information that I had had in the, in the back of my head uh, for quite a while now. What first got me going with numbers was I read, uh, first of all, I felt God leading me into studying numbers. Um, and you have to test those spirits. You have to find out whether or not that's actually in the Bible. So, and, and I didn't want to do it at first because I thought, well, that's numerology. That's a cult and things like that. And there's some of you that have been accused of that. But I began to look at, did God use numbers in the Bible? Does he count things? Is God accurate? Is God about order and structure and patterns? And anybody who reads the Bible who will be honest We'll see that God is a very ordered pattern God. He tells Moses, when you build the tabernacle, make sure you do it exactly the way I showed you to do it, by the order and by the pattern that I showed you to do it. So anyway, um, it goes. Ed Vallow wrote a book. He was a uh, Baptist evangelist. He wrote a book called Numbers in Scripture, or God's Mathematics or something like that. Bible Mathematics, maybe. I don't remember the name of the book. I think you can still buy it different places. But I had a copy of it, and I read through it. And he had mentioned the candlestick. And it had a different number attached to it. And I had forgotten about that when I was going over the information that I showed you on Thursday. And we're going to kind of rehash that here in a little bit. But then a guy wrote in, and he reminded me of that. And I went, I knew that. I knew that. And I went back and I looked at what he was saying. And I'm going to show you <clears throat> what he was saying. I'm going to show you what some other people have sent me just in the last few days since that program went out. Um, and so we're going to be revisiting that candlestick. I And I also, also, the very moment I hit the stop record button on last Thursday's program, it dawned on me something about Nirvana. 
And I mentioned that last Thursday, too. And I'm going to, I got verses. I got verses from the King James Bible that we're going to be looking at. Um, I was going to mention last Thursday, uh, somebody had sent me a, a, a YouTube video to watch, and it was a, um, it was a preview of a new TV show that's coming out, <clears throat> I believe, this fall on CBS. And it's, it's basically from DC Comics, and I don't know if you know this or not. Some people don't know. Superman has a cousin that also came to Earth. Superman's cousin is named Supergirl. CBS is going to put a series on called Supergirl. Naturally, you get the idea... An alien falls from the sky. Now she has superpowers. She can do this. She can do that and so on. And I'm watching this preview. And Supergirl is trying to join, and I don't know if it's one of these secret government organizations that's trying to fight crime, paranormal crime. The term they used is extra normal crime. The organization that she's wanting to work for is called, let's see if I can remember this now, the Department of Extra Normal Operations. And I'm going, okay, no big deal. At some point, in, and you can watch this on YouTube, you just type it in, you'll find it. At some point in this little preview, they don't say Department of Extra Normal Operations, they say DEO. I'm going, okay, that sounds like, you know, like a DOD and a NAACP and things like that. DEO, write that out. D-E-O. What do you see? Deo. It's Latin word for God. And I'm going, dun, dun, dun. That's a, oh, yeah, I get that. Here's this organization playing God. And so I watch that and I'm going, okay, that'll be something to kind of keep my eye out on. And then when I get done watching the Supergirl preview, you know, YouTube now does this, this automatic thing where when you get done watching one video, you got like 15 seconds, Jack, and then you're going to have to watch another video. And the one that came up is another series that's being, I think, being put out from CBS. And it's, <laughs> it's called Angel from Hell. And I'm going, okie dokie. Anyway, the angel from hell, there is this girl in this series that all of a sudden gets visited by her guardian angel. This guardian angel is, is a drunk. She's a loudmouth woman. She curses. She spits. She does all these things. Anyway, the angel is trying to convince the girl that she really is her angel. And here's how she does it. I'm watching this, and I'm going... Oh, I know what you are. I know exactly what you are. This angel is convincing this girl by uh, relaying all of these known events in this girl's life, thoughts that she had, things that she said, secrets that she kept, things about her mother and, you know, all this stuff. Anyway, this angel's reeling off all of this stuff to this girl, and I'm going, I know what that is. I know what that is. That's that, it, you're right. It's an angel, all right. It is a spirit. It is what the Bible calls a familiar spirit. This angel from hell knows just about everything there is to know about this girl because this spirit has been around her all of her life. Knowledge of every detail of her life and so on and so on and so on. And uh, I was going to talk about that Tuesday, and I just got all wrapped up in the whole candlestick thing, and I'm kind of wrapped up in that again today, uh, but just kind of, you can go to YouTube and watch those uh, two previews, and you'll just, you'll go, yep, that's a familiar spirit, yep, yeah, that's what the Bible says, study familiar spirits in the Bible, by the way, uh, because they're everywhere. I'm going to read a couple of emails uh, that were sent in to me, this one is from Bonnie, and um, I'm going to see if you agree with what I told her. Bonnie sent me an email, and she said, our, our, our pastor, this past Sunday, ref, prefaced his sermon 
with some comments about how he had been visited by his dead grandmother in a dream the night before. It is the Pentecostal church, and he has brought Rick Warren and emergent teachings into this church. And I wrote back to Bonnie, and I said, Bonnie, you need to get out of this church. You need to leave this church. There is a spirit of necromancy in that church, and you need to get out of there. I didn't even say, maybe you should talk to your pastor about this and see what he has to say. I didn't do that. Now, let me just say this. I do have a high regard for pastoral authority. I really do. I am a pastor. I've had people try to subvert me in my church to other people. I've had people go around by, behind my back. I've had, I've had people do it in my pulpit, in my absence, trying to subvert the truth of the Word of God with false doctrine while I was away. So I understand how this works. I know all about it. In this case here, I don't have any doubt whatsoever that this particular this particular pastor, this particular church, by talking about having a visitation in his dream from his dead grandmother, there's no doubt in my mind. If Let's just say that I had that dream, that I had a dream and I saw my dead grandmother, and my dead grandmother's telling me things. I would not then get up and preach a message and say, my grandmother told me this and she was a real godly woman and God told her to tell me this. No, 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 no. God doesn't, God is not the God of the dead people. He's the God of the living. And I told this lady to get out of that church. Um, you pray for her and pray and that, that uh, she'll seek God's direction. Um, here is another email that was sent in. Uh, this is from a couple that uh, have been following our ministry for a few years now, and they, they usually send me some pretty good stuff. Um, they said, Pastor Mike, this is an advert on the webpage of the church we used to attend. We're so thankful God delivered us out of that place. And, and the reason why I'm going through this is that we're going to look again at the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit doesn't do, we're gonna we're gonna find that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, the Bible, they are they're right there. They're just they're equal. They're one and the same. So it says uh, we are so thankful God delivered us out of that place. Now we see the error all over. First, it is led by a woman. This also caught my eye. Prophet and the, I'm going to read to you the advertisement. The prophetic activation is one of the SOS keys to your advancement. What is advancement in the kingdom, in, in Christian, in the Christian concept, in the Christian mindset? What is advancement? I don't know what that is. I really don't know what that is. I'm not playing dumb. Maybe I am just dumb, but I, I have no idea what advancement is. I know what salvation is. I know what illumination is by God's Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I know what revival is. I do not know what advancement is. That sounds to me that sounds to me like, well, you're on this level here. When you get to this level here, then you'll be able to get to that level there. That's what it sounds like to me. Also, this guy says God told him to come to Winnipeg to quote unquote. Here we go. Ready? Awaken the giant. Hmm, doesn't sound right. Don't want any giants awaken. And they are stoking a fire in Winnipeg. Doesn't sound good. By the way, he used to be a youth pastor in St. Louis. Really? Yeah, blame it on me. Why don't you? I didn't do it. I didn't know the guy. Um, and, of course, the, the uh, meeting cost $60 to learn how to have this supernatural power, according to the church bulletin. You know, do you know what that is? You know what that is? Let me let me read that. I, I've skimmed. I do this. I skim over stuff that people send me that is in the book of acts oh let's see here acts chapter 8 verse 18 and when simon saw that through laying on of the apostles hands the holy ghost was given he offered them money saying give me also this power that on whomsoever i lay hands he may receive the holy ghost but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with 
money. Guys, you're dead on. I didn't really mean to use the word dead there, but you understand what I'm saying. It costs $60 to learn how to have this supernatural power. There's your clue right there, Sherlock. There's your, there's your idea. You go right to the Word of God and say, you know what? Okay, okay. I don't know if what you're telling me is true, but I know that what you just said is in violation of the Word of God. There's actually a story with you guys in it. Anyway, they write to me and say, I shudder to think we spent so many years in this church and raised our children here. They even attended the private school there. Makes me so sad sometimes, but thanks to God he delivered us. Those were the days we had no clue about the false Bible translations and only read the corrupted versions and believed pastors who were teaching the doctrines, doctrines of devils. I remember one time the church invited a speaker from India. It's interesting. They often had speakers from India. They often had mission trips to India. That This particular time, the Indian preacher called for people to come forward so he could lay hands on them. I went forward with many others. He went from one person to another, and they began to fall. I suddenly felt like I needed to get out of there before he laid hands on me. I remember quickly going back to my seat. In retrospect, I believe God was protecting me from something unclean. Absolutely. There is no doubt in my mind God was doing that. God's done that with me. Protecting me. Guarding me. Angels standing with swords going, you can't touch him. Sorry, you can't. No, uh -uh. You, you, you can scare him, but you can't touch him. They write, another time we were at the house group from that church. Incidentally, the home we always met in was the former home of the Jewish man who was one of the men in the Manhattan Project. Ooh, that's interesting. The Manhattan Project is, um, that's where they were working on the atomic bomb back in World War II. The man who died because he exposed his body to the atomic stuff for taking his coat. I remember that. His body was laid in a lead casket before being flown back to Winnipeg at that time, and his body was in the same living room now we met in. People from our former church had now bought this historical house. But I remember the lady of the house, the house group leader's wife, started going around the room and anointing each person or doing something. I suddenly felt like uh, my husband and I should get out of there. We did before she got to us. She had, an, on another occasion, done something similarly but it actually bent over and kissed one or more men on the fore. Oh, that's that's what that is. Rick being one of them. He was taken aback and couldn't dodge her fast enough. All oh, very weird now when we think, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you say, well, well, maybe that wasn't. Oh, well, maybe it was exactly what you think it might be. Here you have a Jezebel woman going around kissing men in a Bible study group or a prayer group or something like that. Uh, the church we went to before that, the Mennonite church, was just as bad. You say, well, the Mennonites, they're good people, aren't they? Their doctrine is about as Roman Catholic as it gets without the idols and without the statues. You know why? The bishop is the one who declares whether or not people are saved. And it's usually based upon, are you in compliance with the rules that we have? And I will say this, the Mennonite churches in particular, just like the Nazarene churches, have really turned themselves over now to contemplative prayer and all these spiritual practices and exercises. Um, we left after they voted a new pastor in who claimed he used to dress like Dracula but was delivered from that life by some great light. His wife told us on one occasion that her husband reminded her of Rasputin, who was a Russian occult leader. We invited them over for supper and, and asked them some questions. At one point, I remember talking about Jesus, and right in front of us, he started coughing and choking and staring at us intensely. His wife seemed relaxed, and she just said that he was okay. He was just going into his aura, which he often did. Aura? Um, we were shocked and shortly left that church. So Bethel Church is a huge blessing for us. We have not had good church experiences and are not sure we will ever again be able to attend a church, especially since we don't know any of, of any solid Bible-believing churches in this area. God, God bless you, and I appreciate you guys. Here's the, here's the advertisement. It's called The Edge of Time School of the Supernatural. Write this down. 
and maybe type this in, write this down and talk about it later. It's called the Edge of Time School of the Supernatural. And here's the advertisement. Are you hungry for more of God? Are you? Then read some more Bible verses. Do you desire to walk a naturally supernatural life? Do you long for deeper revelation and encounter with the Lord? Then read some more Bible verses. If you answered yes to any of the questions above, you will not want to miss the opportunity to attend, to attend School of the Supernatural. Watch for more details regarding our new module schedule for powerful word-based teaching impartation. You know what that is? Impartation. I'm going to, I've got this packet of electricity in my hands. I've been rubbing balloons on my head now for the past 15 minutes, and I've taken my sweaters off very quickly. So I have this packet of energy in my hand, and I want to be able to touch you and make this energy flow into your body. That's what they're talking about. Um, the SOS is led by Helen Toes, T-O-E-W-S, and myself, another guest ministry sharing in the classes. This will give you opportunity to sit under anointed ministers uh, in a more personal setting and have the chance to ask questions and dialogue with them. Prophetic activation is one of the SOS keys to your advancement. Prophetic activation. Again, I have this electricity. I've been scooting my chair across the carpeted floor, and I have a packet of energy in my hand. And when I touch you with it, you're going to feel the flow of the electricity, of the power being imparted unto you. Um, and that is from edgeoftime.org. The, the heart of Trevor and Edge of Time is a local church of Winnipeg. Trevor came to Winnipeg accompanied by a word from God. Not like John 3.16 or anything like that. It's, oh, I'm getting a word from God. Hallelujah. Um, and the word was, here we go. Ready? Ready? The word from God was, awaken the giant. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, Joel Osteen's theme song, Discover the Champion Within You. I, uh, and I'm going to probably drop little things like this every now and then. I went to see, uh, some of you recommended it to me. I went to see the new Avengers motion picture indoctrination film last night. And, um, I'm, I, that's one of the things that you hear in that movie is that humans should have realized. I wrote it. I keep my phone handy and I make notes in my Evernotes while I'm watching these movies. People think I'm texting. I'm not. I'm making notes. At one point, the artificial intelligent evil robot. That sounds like a movie I've seen before. The artificial intelligent evil robot says that humans... Uh, it never occurred to them that their power is within them or some, some kind of nonsense like that. Anyway, it's about, and they use several, several Bible references in this movie, including at one point, upon this rock, I will build my church. I'm not making, I went, duh, I got to write that down. I'm putting it in my notes. Anyway, the word that this guy got from God was awaken the giant. Does that, does that ring a bell to you? Does that sound familiar to, to you? There has been a prophetic destiny placed over Winnipeg and the place Trevor has in bringing this forth. This destiny, by the way, if you have never seen the occult symbols in the buildings in Winnipeg, Canada, go Google it. There is a, there is a principality over this town, buddy. I'm telling you. Anyway. This destiny is beginning to unfold with the awakening meetings. That's what they call them, the awakening. Your God's asleep. That's what Elijah told the prophets of Baal. What, is your God asleep? Does he need to be awakened? That's the truth. Their God right now is asleep. He's dead. He's in a casket. There was a casket in the movie last night, the Avengers movie. 
He's in a casket. He's dead. He's asleep. He needs to be awakened and rise up. Uh, the meetings are bringing several ministries uh, to worship, pray, and seek the face of the Lord. This growing move of the Spirit is being accompanied by nameless, faceless, hungry lovers of God taking the power of God to their workplaces, schools, and the streets of Winnipeg. These are hungry people who are being uh, conformed to the image of Christ and do the works they see the Father doing. The giant in Winnipeg is indeed being awakened and a fire. Listen to that. A fire is being stoked that will spread to the nations. This is www.edgeoftime.com. Dot .org go look at that for yourself. I appreciate you guys sending this to me and I'm going to talk about how to, we we were talking about the other day how to get the Holy Spirit. Oh, you're going to you're going to like this. Um let me go back and 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 do this real quick. Did I read that the other day? Um the ultimate interface is your brain. This is an article that came uh, through Flipbook. It's a uh, it's an app. I have it on my phone. I have it on my tablet. I love it. Uh, it delivers relevant story. I read tech stories just about every day. Uh, and here is one that that came up uh, yesterday, called "The Ultimate Interface Is Your Brain." The final frontier of the digital technology is integrating into your own brain. DARPA, DARPA. You know what that is? The Defense Department. The Defense Department, the people who work in a uh, five-pointed Pentagon, the people who want to win all the wars, DARPA wants to go there. Scientists want to go there. Entrepreneurs want to go there. And increasingly, it looks like it's possible. You've probably read bits and pieces about brain implants and prosthesis. Let me give you the big picture. Um, Arkady, this is apparently a, a book that this guy wrote, a character in a book. Arkady flicked the virtual layer back on. Lightning sparkled around the dancers on stage again. Electricity flashed from the DJ booth. Silver waves crashed onto the beach. A wind that wasn't real blew against his neck. That is adapted from a book called The Crux, Book Two of the Nexus Trilogy. Neural implants could accomplish things no external interface could. Virtual and augmented reality with all five senses, augmentation of human memory, attention and learning speed, even multi-sense telepathy, sharing what we see, hear, touch, and even perhaps what we think and feel with others. Sound crazy? It is. And it's not. Start with motion, and and you can. Re I, I'm going to uh, try to remember to post this on my Pastor Mike online Facebook page. You can read the um, the full article there. It's it's quite large, but it's quite interesting. But basically, it's the idea that computers are going to interface with our human brains. Now, here is another article. Uh, this accompanies a video by Ray Kurzweil. You remember who he is? Ray Kurzweil is the guy that says that by 2049, 2039, somewhere around in 2045, somewhere around in there, mankind will be immortal, which means mankind is actually going to do what was promised by the serpent in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. Ray Kurzweil wants this real bad. Ray Kurzweil does not want to die for obvious reasons. Doesn't believe in God. He is going to hell when he dies. And so he's decided he doesn't want to die. What he wants to do is live forever. So he is he's using his, his personal means. He is gathering people together at what's called the Singularity University. Ray Kurzweil funds this, other companies fund it, and you get the top thinkers in the world together, and they sit around with um, computers and pieces of paper, and they draw out ideas, and they decide what can be done, and so on, and um, that's what accompanies this order. But you'll hear several things from Ray Kurzweil going, I'm still, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Pretty sure I'm right. At some point, we'll live forever. At some point, computers will be artificially intelligent. By the way, by the way, that word, that word, artificially intelligent, 
Hang on a second. Artificially intelligent. Genesis chapter 4. Do you ever think about words? Do you ever think about words? Where they come from? I do. I Every time I, I don't know, every now and then I get a word and I'm just going, artificial. What does that word mean? It's got the word art in it. Some guy named Art made that word, right? Uh, no. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Verse 22, and uh, this is the lineage of Cain. And Zillah also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. You know what an artificer is? An artificer is someone who takes things and make artificial versions of them by doing artificering. Okay? By doing art, graving it with art and man's device. That's what that is. That's what artificial intelligence is. Uploading your brain to a computer is closer to becoming a reality. Taking a mind and offloading it to software is consistent with physics, and it's something that I think will be done in this century, said Martin Rothblatt, founder of the Sirius Satellite Radio and CEO of United Therapeutics during an interview at eMERGE Americas on Monday. Rothblatt said she shares the beliefs of computer scientist Ray Kurzweil that technology advancements will ultimately enable human being to live forever. One of the first stages in this process could include preserving a human's brain in software to keep them alive after the body has died. Rothblatt's company, United Therapeutics, does work in transplanting organs, and she said her experience in the field has helped shape her views on the matter. But the idea, this article here, it's about uploading your brain, uploading your brain to a computer system and using the, I don't know, they're, they're going to figure out how to make the connections between the computer world and the brain world. And we're moving in that direction as we speak. I mentioned the other day, let me... Uh, Let's see if I can find that. I'll show that to you because somebody questioned that on uh, Google the other day. I showed you this. I showed you the uh, Feel Real Virtual Reality Mask and Nirvana Virtual Reality Helmet. I showed you that the other day, right? Okay. Um, the Feel Real Virtual Reality Mask and the Nirvana Virtual... And by the way, the symbol here, that of a bu butterfly... I watched the Avengers last night. Guess what? There's butterfly symbolism. I'm not, and, and it's not like way back in the background, you can barely see the haze of a butterfly flying by. I'm talking like they go to a scene of a butterfly, a kid drawing of a butterfly on a piece of paper. Okay. And some would go, see, you, uh, 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 MK Ultra Mind Control CIA. The CIA put that movie out. That's what happened. The evil CIA. They're what? I had a lady call the office the other day. There's some things that are just not believable. I had a lady call the office the other day, and I feel bad for her. She wanted to be taken off of our watchers mailing list, where you get DVDs and CDs every month. And they said, okay, why? And she said, because I heard Pastor Mike talk about how the American government was corrupt. And she said, he's going to start being targeted now by the NSA and the government, and I want my name taken off the list so they don't come after me. I, listen, and I'm not making that up either. I am not making that up. You pray for this lady. I'm not making fun of her. You pray for her. But here's the thing. It's not the evil. I know the CIA is evil. It's not them that are at the core of everything. It's not. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. The God of this world, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, she's the one, or that spirit is the one at work right now do, writing movie scripts, writing commercials, drawing hexagrams everywhere and hexagons everywhere. That's what's going on. You need to understand the spirit behind this. And there is a spirit behind this. See the symbolism of a butterfly. Oh, wow. The camera just turned red, didn't it? Anyway, the symbol of the butterfly is you go from a worm, you get into a chrysalis, which is what a, like a casket and you die. 
and then you're rebirthed in a in a new way. God designed that to show us what resurrection is. But anyway, the four wing, butterflies have four wings. If you go to Ezekiel chapter one, you'll see the cherubims each had four wings. The number four is indicative of the spiritual realm. And I'm looking at that butterfly here on the front of this feel real virtual reality mask. And I see the butterfly in the Avengers movie and I'm going, I know what that is. I know what that is. It's about transformation. And they were talking all through the movie about evolve and mankind must change. And there must be a transformation, must be an evolution and a revolution and a paradigm shift. And I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing was right out of Marilyn Ferguson's Aquarian Conspiracy. Anyway, the Nirvana VR helmet. And I went to look at, because I've heard this before, I went to look at what Nirvana was. And I pulled up the Wikipedia page. Hang on a second. I have to, I had to, I didn't click this right. I got to click this and do that and do it that way and that. All right, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Here is the Wikipedia uh, article on Nirvana. Let me get my ugly face out of the way. The word Nirvana, Sanskrit, literally means blown out as in a candle. And they give you the source for that. It is most commonly associated with Buddhism. In the Buddhist context, nirvana refers to the imperturbable stillness of mind after the fires of desire, aversion, and delusion have been finally extinguished. Now, I want you to think about that word, delusion, because it's not meaning delusion the way you and I see it. It means delusion. Um, they think that the word of God would be delusion or the truths of God would be delusion. And that's, and I've got proof for that. I, when, when I, when I went and looked at this again, I went, you know, Mike, the word candle is in the King James Bible. I wonder if the King James Bible has anything smart or intelligent to say about um, uh, the word candle. And some of you you're already pulling up the software and you're typing in the word candle. I want to see what he's got to say. You're going to like this. The idea of nirvana is that the light goes out. A wind or a spirit has blown out the light. It has blown out the candle. The candle of what they call here, the extinguished the fires of desire, aversion, and delusion. They've been finally extinguished. In Hindu philosophy, it is the union with Brahman, the divine ground of existence, and the experience of blissful egolessness. Now, again, I, I looked at this Thursday, but when I, when I realized that not only the word candle was in the King James Bible, and I looked at the word candle, and I'm going to read to you, there's like 16 occurrences of just the word candle. In your King James, pull up your Pure Bible Search software if you want to, and look at these verses with me. The one that sticks out most prominently is Proverbs 20, verse 27. Listen to what, now this is, this is what God said about it. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. So we have a spiritual connection between the uh, the idea of a candle, the spirit of a man. Stop right here. I just had a thought. I just had a thought. You have a spirit in you. God designed you with. You, the Bible, Paul talks about our spirit, our soul, and our body. You have a spirit in you. By way of Buddhism, you can have that spirit, which God calls a candle. You can have that spirit blown out of you. Remember that song we used to sing? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And then we would sing, won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Remember we used to do that? Listen to this. Think about this. Your candle, your spirit... Buddhism wants to blow it out. 
Benny Hinn wants to murder it. The Pentecostal preacher and the charismatic preacher, they want to murder your spirit. They want your spirit gone is what they want. They want you slain in the spirit. I submit to you that the concept of slain in the spirit and nirvana of having your candle blown out, one and the same. Especially in the light of, did you get that little pun? Let's look at some other verses where the word candle is used in the King James. Remember, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Watch this. Job 18.6. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle. You know what a tabernacle is? It's the human body. And his candle shall be put out with him. His candle is put out. You know what that is? That's blissful egolessness. That's nirvana. Job 18.6, and what I want you, I'm just going to go through the scriptures. What I want you to do is make up your own list and draw a circle around these verses and go read afterward or before and afterward so you get the whole context of what's talk, being talked about here. Job 18.6, the light shall be dark in his tabernacle and his candle shall be put out with, with him. Job 21.17, how off is the candle of the wicked put out? Did you, did you see that? The candle of the wicked is put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. The candle being blown out, nirvana, slain in the spirit, is God's judgment based upon his anger, is what that is. Job 29.3, when his candle shined upon my head, and when his light, I walked through darkness. Uh, I'm just reading all the verses with the word candle in it. Psalm 1828, for thou wilt light my candle, the Lord God will enlighten my darkness. Buddhism will put you in darkness. It will put you in this big outer darkness thing. That's what nirvana is. It is complete darkness on the inside of you. Um, I haven't read the rest of the article on nirvana, but I would imagine that it has that same idea. The light's gone out. Yep, the light's gone out, and there's nobody home. Um, for thou wilt light my candle, the Lord will enlighten my darkness. Proverbs 24, 20. Therefore there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Proverbs 31, 18. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. You know who that is? That's the church. That's the virtuous woman who has the real Holy Spirit in her, and her candle does not go out at night. She keeps a candle lit all night long. Those of you, um, we have this in our house. Um, when all the lights go off, we don't live in the city. We kind of live out in the countryside a little bit. And when we turn our lights out at night, it is dark outside. There is a dusk to dawn light outside there. And we have a couple little bitty night lights in the house to help you kind of see your way through the house in darkness. That's always a good idea. Um, Jeremiah 25, 10. Moreover, I will take from the, them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. Compare that to... Revelation 18.23, compare Jeremiah 25.10 with Revelation 18.23, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. He's talking about Babylon. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Revelation 18.23, Jeremiah 25.10 talks about the voice of the bridegroom and the bride being gone and the candle being put out. You know what I think that is? I think that is Christ and his church leaving, and now the candle is out. There's no more light in this world. Jesus said two things. He said, number one, I am the light of the world, and then he said, ye are the light of the world. Which one? Yes, they both are. God uses us to be light in this world right now, and someday... The light is going to go out in this world. Uh, Matthew 5.15, this is where that little song comes from. Neither do men light a candle, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. See that? 
boy, this Bible, this King James Bible, I, I just, it, it's, it awes me. I stand in reverence to these pure words in this sacred book. It just, it just amazes me that here you are. I'm reading this article on Nirvana and it says, you know, to be blown out like a candle. And I'm just going, the Holy Ghost is going. Mike, the word candles in the King James Bible. Look it up. Mike, the candle. Candle. Look at the word candle in the King James Bible. Man. Uh, let's see here. Luke 11, 33 says, No man, when he lighteth a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. Verse 36 says, If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. And God has already said that that candle is your spirit. And I believe that one of the objectives, or maybe the objective, and this is just something that I just thought of just an hour or two ago, the objective seems to me would be to rid man of his spirit. Because Proverbs 20 again says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. And then you look at Luke eleven thirty six. 36, that the whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. By the way, I think our spirit is what is in communion with God's spirit. I, that's you know, it's kind of what I've heard over the years. I haven't really studied it out. I got a long, I got a long list of things that I really want to study out one of these days. Uh, but anyway, just kind of break down this concept. Nirvana wants to blow that candle out. The Pentecostal wants to slay you in that spirit and kill that spirit and get it out of the way. Boy, think about that. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I ain't saying I got it all figured out, but I'm telling you, this Bible is right in what it says, and this Bible is what illuminates our eyes and our minds to what is going on in the world around us. If we will just take a look around, walk circumspectly, and then look in our Bible, we'll just go, this is that which is spoken. Luke 15, 8, either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. If she loses one, she wants it all. I've, I've lost a coin. I've lost a silver. I need that. I've got to pay rent. She what? She lights a candle and lets the candle help her search out the entire house. The house is the body, by the way. Now we find in Revelation 22, 5, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. Just think about this, think about this one thing of nirvana and the candlestick and the candle. Nirvana wanting to blow the candle out. And here, here we are talking about the candle of man, which is his spirit. And then in the tabernacle. Let me transition here to, let's see, what button do I push? There we go. Let's segue into this here. This is what we were talking about um, last week. Take your Bibles. Let me get a swig here. Take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 25. Begin reading in verse 31. Again, Several people have helped me with this, and I, I love that part of the ministry, is my eyes can only see so much in the Bible. It's kind of like, and Donna, the um, software lady, will she'll corroborate this or co corroborate this. I was thinking of collaborate and corroborate, which is corroborate. Uh, but anyway, she will, she'll say what I'm saying. Quit trying to be smart, Mike. Anyway, um, when one set of eyes is looking at, I don't know, a million and a half lines of computer code, you can't see all the mistakes in it. 
one of the whole things that started the Linux thing was that Linus, Linus Torvalds posted in a uh, news group that he was working on a Unix-like operating system and he needed some help with it and people began to just pitch in and when they had the first Linux kernel done they decided to just distribute it to everybody and let them look at it and let them find all the bugs in it and um, so anyway the one set of eyes can only see so much many sets of eyes can see lots of things and um, I believe that God wanted us in this time and at this in this day to be searching the scriptures and seeing things you search one place i'll search another and we'll all get together on what i i cannot take the credit for the things that i'm going to show you other than there's some ideas that i have added after that but uh one of our dear sweet followers sent me this about the candlestick in the tabernacle and then when I put this out Thursday, another guy watched it and he said, Mike, let me let me show you what I see in it. And he shared it with me and I'm going to share that with you today. And then when he when he brought that back to my memory, back to my attention, I wrote him back some things that I knew about it further that he hadn't thought about. And that's just how it works. It's not a competition. It's not about, Lord, why didn't you give that to me? I did that one time. I was listening to a guy preach one time. Boy, it was wise. I mean, it was good. And I was sitting there kind of upset, and I said, God, why didn't you give me that? And God's like, I just did. I just gave it to you. It's not a competition. We're all in this. We're all seeing things in the Word of God, and, and, and it just absolutely blesses me. All right, Exodus 25, verse 31, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches and his bowls, his knops and his flowers shall be of the same. By the way, I, I commented Thursday on, I think there is a difference between the tabernacle furniture being made of gold and let's say a, um, a molten image or a sculpted image, a graven image. Because if you look, I checked this out. And in, when God told Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant with the two angels on it, um, the angels were to be of beaten work, which means they would take gold, which is by nature, it's, it's sort of a very soft uh, element, and they were to take it and they were to beat it in shape, beat it in the shape that they wanted instead of being sculpted or instead of being molten and poured into like a mold of some kind. I don't know what the difference is, but I think there is a difference here, all right? But anyway, it's to be of beaten work. Uh, six branches, verse 32, shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of, out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like an almond with a knop and a flower in one branch. Three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. There should be a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under two branches of the same. And a knop under two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. The, in other words, I think it means it was supposed to be symmetrical. That if you have a knop and a, and a flower and a bowl, an almond here, that you have, have it on the corresponding side. I think that's what it's talking about. But anyway, um, verse 36, their knops and their branches shall be of the same. It, and all of it, all it, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall make the lamps there, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. Now, here's what we were talking about the other day. I'm going to run through this kind of quickly. Uh, because I want to get to what's on the end of this thing. Because, I, man, I really just just in a few days, God has given me more understanding of what this is all about. And I love this kind of stuff. To me, it just it proves, number one, we didn't come from monkeys. We were made by God. We were fashioned in his image. God took us and <laughs> you might say God's just beating us into shape. Can I hear somebody say Amen. <laughs> Yeah, God's beating us in the shape, all right? But anyway, here, here's here's the thing. You have here's the here's a picture of the of the candlestick 
Um, and here's like a close up. I don't know who did this labeling here, but it was the best picture I could find. You have the branch, you have the shaft in the middle, you have a, f- a flower, you have a knop which is like the bud of the flower, and then you have the bowl, which is the almond. And so on the candlestick itself, you had a, you had a, a bowl, an almond, and a knop, and a flower here, a bowl, a knop, and a flower, bowl, knop, flower. You had the same on the other side, symmetrical. It means it's on the same side, or it's on a different side in the same line. You have a bowl, a knop, and a flower, bowl, not flower, bowl, not flower. So here's what we did. There are three distinct elements here. One, two, three. Three here. Three here. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. By the way, I'm just, my mind just races. There was a movie called Mission to Mars. I don't know if you saw it. Don Cheadle, um, he is an American actor. He is in the, um, he's in, he was in the Avengers movie that I saw last night. He is the other Iron Man. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, Don Cheadle was in this movie, and he was left on Mars. They landed near the face, quote, unquote, that's on Mars. And Don Cheadle was showing them that he kept receiving this transmission from this face on Mars. And it was a repetitive pattern. You know what the pattern was? Three, 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 three. That was the repetitive pattern, okay? You see 333 three, three here? You say, well, I don't think there's a connect. Just wait. Just wait, okay? I'm going to show you. So what you have here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine here, nine here, nine here, nine here, nine here, nine here, and four here. So we have nine, 18. Did I get that right? Yeah. 9, 18, 27. Over here, 9, 18, 27. And then up here, you have 3, 6, 9, 12. And what I showed you Thursday was that this is, this course corresponds to, let me kind of skip forward here. This corresponds to... You have 27 on this side, 27 on this side, and 12 in the middle. Now, I saw an email earlier today, I don't know when it came in, that said, now, am I thinking this right? Like 27 books, that'll take you up to the book of Daniel, and then you have the 12 minor prophets after that. That's the Old Testament. Yes, you're dead on. And then you have the 27 books of the New Testament. That's exactly right. You got it. That's exactly right. You win the prize. And the idea is, is that the, the candlestick represents how a man is illuminated in his tabernacle. His tabernacle is this right here. Here is his heart. That's where the throne is. And the four chambers are the four living creatures. Here is his uh, 24 elders of his rib cage. By the way, by the way. Again, I, you people are sending me this stuff, and I'm just going, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Hang on. Where's, where's the article? Where is it? Ah! Lady writes in, and she says, you know, Pastor, I was listening to you, and I got to thinking, because that's what I want you to do. I want you to think. I want you to, I want to think, I want you to think on your own. I want you to, th- and I'll tell you what, that kind of talk makes people dangerous. I want you to think on your own. I want you to think Bible. And this lady wrote in, she said, you know, pastor, you know, those 24 ribs and the 12 on one side and the 12 on the other, like the the 12 here would be the 12 apostles and the 12 here is the 12 tribes. You know why I picked the left side for Israel, the 12 tribes? Because that's where the heart is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's where the heart is. When God told the high priest, Aaron, put on that breastplate, it had 12 stones in it with the names of the 12 tribes so that when Aaron went in to perform the sacrifice and the atonement, that the names of the tribes of Israel would be where? You ought to go read that. On his heart. Whew. Do you know what that means? 
It means that when Christ was dying on the cross and offering his body as the atonement, he was thinking of the very people that nailed him to that cross, namely Israel. Mm -mm -mm. Boy, I love this. But she said, you know, Pastor, I got to thinking. The 12 on one side is the 12 apostles. Jesus picked these apostles, but one of them was taken out. Judas Iscariot. And another was put in his place. Matthias. And then you have the same, you have symmetry. You have this, not cemetery, symmetry. It's this side and this side, and they look the same. Your face is symmetrical, okay? If I were to cover up this part, of, don't, don't think I'm doing this Illuminati stuff. If I were to cover up this part, part of my face, you see my eyes here, my nostril here, half of my mouth and my ear. On the other side of my face, the eye is not way down here somewhere and the ear is sticking out front. It's symmetrical. So watch this. And by the way, your Bible is symmetrical. Don't believe these clowns that are telling you the Bible is full of contradictions and you must look at it dispensationally or else it won't make any sense. Mm -mm. It's completely and perfectly symmetrical. Okay? Now watch this. Okay? Over on the Israel side, if you look in Revelations chapter 7, you know what's missing? Dan. Dan was taken out. And if you look, another was, was put in his place. You have the half-tribe of Manasseh being as part of Joseph. It was, it was always rendered in the Old Testament as Manasseh and Ephraim. But you have the name Joseph now. You also have Levi in there. Dan's taken out, and it looks like Manasseh has taken his place. And this lady said, I read somewhere that if you lose a rib or it's broken off, another one grows back. And I went, and I found an article. This is from the Daily Mail. Uh, it says, we can regenerate. Researchers reveal our ribs regrow if damaged and say the same could be true of our entire skeleton. Now, I don't know how much that is true, but it says here, that if we break a rib, it can grow back a new one. And that is exactly what God did here, is that he took one out. In the New Testament, it was Judas, and another one was put in his place. Same thing in the Old Testament. Dan is missing from the list in Revelation 7, but um, Manasseh, takes his place, you still have 12 in there. And this stuff, you're the ones who are seeing it. You're the ones who, once I give you the base of it, you're taking it, and I'm just, I would have never thought of that. Maybe I would have. I don't know. But God is using you people. You're, you're Bible believers. You're Bible trusters. You believe every word is intact in the word of God, and you don't feel like changing it all the time. That's a blessing. But anyway, here's your 24 elders surrounding the throne of God. And then you have thunderings, lightnings, and voices. You have the, by the way, you have the heart in the pericardium. The pericardium is the sea of glass because the pericardium is full of seawater, ocean water, salt water, same thing. So is the womb, by the way. Um, here's the four-chamber heart and the pericardium. Here is where the thundering and the lightning comes from. It comes from the beating of the heart, which runs on electricity. And the voices, your voice box is like right in here. By the way, see this area right here that I'm pointing at in my mouse? That is roughly the area where the, it's actually right here. Roughly the area where there's a bulge in my disc and it's pushing into my spinal cord right at the mid thoracic area. That's what I'm going to hopefully have worked on uh, later on this week. Um, anyway, we dealt with that. The 60, this 66 books, 
You have 27 here and 12. That's 39. That's the Old Testament. You have 27 here. That's the New Testament. And the the thing is, is that the Holy Spirit does give us illumination, but the source of that illumination is the 66 decorations here, which correspond to the 66 books of the Word of God. When people will realize that, and by the way, here's the seven spirits. You have the superior lobe, you have the middle lobe, you have the uh, inferior lobe, one, two, three. And on the left side, the reason why you only have two lobes here and not three, look at that, look at that little heart-shaped hole there. Get that? Okay. Isn't that cool? That's the reason why your, your left lung is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit less there because it's got to make room for the heart. Um, anyway, you have one, two, three, four, five, and then the bronchus tube splits into two. That's six, seven. All of this has to do with the spirit and the seven spirits of God. So the teaching is that the seven spirits of God are represented by the candlestick. The seven spirits give us breath. It gives us life. It gives us illumination. But it also the source of that is the 66 books of the Word of God. And that's important because, let me pull these articles back out here. Because we're told, we're told, uh, I won't say we, some people are. They're being deceived. One, one preacher saying, I had a dream last night and I saw my dead grandmother and she told me that God wants to bless our church financially. And, and if everybody would so, I don't know that the preacher said that, but he's talking about receiving illumination from his dead grandmother. By the way, he said, oh, I'd never listen to somebody like, by, by the way, Pastor Mike, what do you think about Perry Stone? Go look it up. Perry Stone and his dad sitting around talking about how his dad came in contact with his old dead friend. That's necromancy. And it, by the way, his old dead friend showed him heaven and showed him a library in heaven with books in it, which were the books of other things that Jesus said that didn't make it, didn't make the cut into the Bible. That's a setup. It's a set. They're setting you up, people, because somebody later is going to come along and say, I saw I got to see what was in those books. Let me tell you what I read in one of those books that you know what that is. That is for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. That's what that is. It's a setup to a secret doctrine that's in a book in heaven that. It, that it needs to be opened up and revealed to people. That's the kind of junk you get through necromancy. That's the kind of stuff that if you believe these, these rascals who go around imparting things to everybody, who have all this electricity in their hands and they need to shock it into you, and they'll tell you, oh, not everything that God does is in the Bible. And you go, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See, it says right there, all scripture furnishes all good works. Wow. The word... <laughs> the word furnish... In that passage, thoroughly furnished into all good works. My daughter, uh, Sparky the Firehead, her and her husband just bought a house, and they're moving in it today. Okay, guess where I am? Not helping them move in it. Okay, I can't. I can't lift anything. So <laughs> how convenient is that? So anyway, they're moving in. I went to the house yesterday and looked at it. It's a nice house. Really, really cute house. Okay. Two story. It's got a full basement. I like that. Okay. It's like a, it's like a three story house, what it is. All right. But anyway, here's the thing. Okay. That house right now is empty and it's unfurnished and humans don't move into a house without furnishing the house. And you're going, okay, Pastor Mike. Yeah, amen. Woo, I had no idea what that means. 
the tabernacle was not empty. It was furnished. Thoroughly furnished with stuff like this. Man. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Now, now, here's here's what another guy sent me. He said, PM, this is pretty stinking awesome. And he said, uh, I got something else I'm going to share with you. And I and when he showed it to me, I knew it. Okay, because I had read it. Ed Velo knew it. And he wrote it in his book, and I read it. And, and I, I just kind of stuck it on a card file in my head. And it was there, and I didn't remember it until this guy wrote it to me. And then I remembered it. And he said, Pastor Mike, if you kind of break this down even further, just consider these as being all one. One, two, three. You have one here, one here, and one here. So you have a not flower bowl, not flower bowl, not flower bowl. Now count the decorations as being one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. He said, Pastor, there are 22 bowls that contain the oil that feed the lights. 22. And he said, isn't 22 the number for revelation and I went oh yeah absolutely absolutely look at that revelation you know what the you know what the last book of your bible is it's called revelation you know how many chapters it has two and two 22 chapters it by the way is the 66th book of the Bible, which is, oh, I don't know, 22 times three, something like that in that ballpark in that neighborhood. Yeah, 22 is the number for revelation. All right. Let me now. And when he wrote that to me, I, I had Sweetie Pie at the mall just walking around. She was shopping. I was looking at stuff on my phone. This is what I do on Sweetie Pie Day. And that email came in and I went, I got something else to add to it. I know what that is. I know what that is. <gasps> This is so cool. Get ready for this one. Watch this one. The number 22. Remember that you can discover the Hebrew Aleph Beth just by reading a King James Bible. And the reason why I'm saying that is, please, 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 pretty please, don't follow the Hebrew roots movement. Don't follow them. Don't go get your stuff from them. Don't go try to get light from them. They're lying through their teeth. They're going to try to tell you there's a secret mystical thing about the Hebrew Aleph Beth. And the, the, the first letter, Aleph, um, never is silent. And that's God because God's, God's profoundness is in silence. And it's like an ox when it was first written out. And, and God is an ox. And they're, they're setting you up is what they are. They're teaching you Kabbalah witchcraft. Don't fall for it. So if you just want illumination, go read Psalm 119, all 176 verses of it. You'll get all the illumination that you can handle in one day, I guarantee you. But Psalm 119 is broken down by the letters of the Hebrew, Aleph Beth. Aleph, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And just about every verse in Psalm 119 uses the word law, statutes, judgments, precepts, word, things that relate to the written record of the word of God. You have eight verses, and then you have Beth, another section, another segment. Um, and I have heard, and I think this is true, that Psalm 119 in Hebrew, the first letter of every section begins with that corresponding letter. In other words, the first word in Hebrew in Psalm 119 starts with an Aleph. In verse 9, the first word starts with the letter Beth and so on. Now, and that's a pattern that runs down Psalm 119. There is a similar pattern 
in the book of Lamentations, if you turn over to the book of Lamentations, you'll see it has five chapters. The first two chapters have 22 verses apiece. And in the Hebrew, every verse, the first word of every verse in Hebrew is that alphabetical sequence of the Hebrew alphabet. In other words, verse 1, the first word starts with Aleph. In verse 2, the first word starts with Beth. In verse 3, the uh, first word starts with Gimel. And then verse 4, Daleth. And then verse 5, Hey. And then verse 6, Vav. And then verse 7 is Zion and so on. And that does that in chapter 1, chapter 2. In chapter 3, it has 66 verses in it. And every third verse has that same pattern. And then you get to chapter 4 and 5, and you go back to 22 verses apiece. Now, I'm studying the book of Lamentations, and I've got some theories on it, and I'm not ready to talk about it yet. All right? But anyway, here's why I'm showing all this. Here are the 22 letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. And coincidentally and not accidentally, here are the 22 amino acids that form and group together to form the letters which make the words which spell out the genes in your DNA. Remember, DNA in Psalm 139 is a book. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. DNA is a book, and it's, it's written in Hebrew. That's, that's what I can kind of discern from that. It's got 22 amino acids, and those 22 amino acids are what makes the letters of the words of the genetic structure of the book of DNA. Scientists know this now. 50 years ago, it was brand new news. Watson and Crick were just coming out with the structure and the overall makeup of DNA. And nobody reading the Bible ever really made this connection. But now we can. Now we look at it and we go, yeah, DNA is a book. And God wrote that book. And that book is like the King James Bible. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So watch that. This is where it gets cool. Okay. Because I'm not just going to leave you hanging here. This is really, I, I love this. Take a look at this. The number 22, in the 22nd chapter of your King James Bible, is a revelation. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son. Guess who that is? Guess who that is? Guess who that only son is? Isaac is a picture. It's a foreshadow of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou, lo whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. You know where Moriah is? It's where Jerusalem is. Where it's where Jerusalem is. It's the city of peace. And there's a hill called Golgotha on Mount Moriah. And offer him there. God didn't tell him to sacrifice him. That's what the stupid NIV says and all the other new translations. God didn't tell him to sacrifice him. Because if he did, Abraham would have had to have killed him. He told him to offer him there. So he offered him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. You see a revelation here in Genesis 22? You see this, you see the revealed son of God and God's plan for redemption in Genesis 22. And you know what you see in Psalm 22? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, they pierce my hands and feet. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Is there a revelation there? Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, let me, a little, little factoid of information. They pierced Jesus. It mentions they pierced my hands and feet. They pierced Jesus in his hands and feet. That's four piercings. But then they run a spear through his side. That's five. You know, Psalm 22, if you pull up the Pure Bible Search software and pull up Psalm 22 and look at its number, it's the 500th chapter of the King James Bible. Mm, 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 mm. Think of the five Philistine lords. In Joshua chapter 10, they were smitten, hung on five trees, and then thrown into a cave before, before sundown. It's a, it's a foreshadowing of the cross, people. I'm, I'm telling you, this Bible, is, this Bible is right. It's in order. It's laid out perfectly. 
the order and the structure of the King James Bible, there isn't a book in the universe that touches it, with the exception, of course, DNA. But in Psalm 22, you have a, you have a revelation of Jesus Christ because the very words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, were spoken by Jesus on the cross, but it came out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And the, and the Israelites, the Jews around the cross, they said, I would, what did he, what did he say? I don't know. He said something about Elias. I think he's wanting Elias to come down and save him. That's what I think. Are you sure that's what he said? That's what I think he said. That's not what he said. He was quoting Psalm 22, a revelation. And had they known that, had they made the connection between the New and the Old Testament, and there's Christ, had they made that connection, they would have went, uh, guys, didn't they just part his garments and cast lots for his clothes? Yeah, why? What are you thinking? Didn't they just pierce his hands and feet? Yeah, what are you getting at? Didn't he just say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Yeah, what, what is, what's your point? Uh, that was written by David over a thousand years ago. I think we just killed the Messiah. They would have known that. But God closed their eyes and put slumber in them. And they didn't see it. They had eyes to see, didn't see it. They had ears to hear. And they heard, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabak, but they didn't know what it was. I know what it is. You know how I know? I have my Bible translated for me in English so I can read it. I can read the New Testament, then I can go back and read the Old Testament in the exact same language. Symmetry. You see it? The 27th, excuse me, the 22nd book of the King James Bible is Song of Solomon. That's that book that you tell nine-year-old boys, don't read that book. Don't read that book. Okay? Then you get about 14, they're going to read it. Okay? And Song of Solomon is one of those books that we look at and we're going, okay, why is this in here again? And you know what it is? It's a revelation. 22nd book of the Bible. It's a revelation. You know what it is? A revelation of Christ and his spouse. My spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. You know who that is? That's Jesus saying that about his spouse, his bride. He loves us. Psalm, Psalm 19 says, the way the sun comes up in the morning is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Here he comes. He's ready to get married. Isn't that sweet? You know what this 22nd chapter of the New Testament is, Matthew 22? Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a king which made a marriage for his son. Down at the end of Matthew 22, which again, the 22nd chapter of the New Testament is this. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, Who think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's giving parables, and in those parables, he's revealing who the Son of God is. And he's going to get married one of these days. Man, I love this. Now, let's go back to this, all right? Psalm 119, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which make the book. 22 letters here, 22 amino acids. Let me show you how these amino acids are formed, okay? Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. 
All the, all of you that have sent me things in the last couple days, see that's I told you this is not a live program. I'm pre-recording it. I'm coming in on a Saturday. All right. It's just been two days since I put out the Pastor Mike Online from last Thursday. And in two days' time, people are just going, Pastor Mike, let me show you this. One lady writes in and tells me about the ribs. One guy writes in and tells me about the 22 bowls. And I, I'm just, I'm just, I stand in awe, people, at how God reveals and is opening our eyes in these days. Not through some esoteric knowledge, not through some secret revelations that we're getting from a spirit of some kind. We're reading them in the Bible, and we're looking at, at what's in our world and how God created it, and we match them together, and we say, this is what God is doing here. This is God right here. This is God's signature on this right here. I was talking to a customer service guy the other day, and um, the subject, I don't know how it came up, the subject of the Fibonacci sequence came up, and he said, what is that again? I said, the Fibonacci sequence, have you not heard of that? And he said, no. And he said, I like mathematics a lot and number patterns. And I went, I went into detail and I said, you ever seen a spiral galaxy? Yeah. I said, you ever flush the toilet? He said, yeah. I said, the water going down the bowl, does it just go down the bowl? It forms a spiral, doesn't it? And he said, yeah. I said, it's the same ratio between a spiral galaxy and the water going down your sink or your bathtub or your toilet. And when it is, isn't it? And I said, the human ear, the way it curls, it's the same ratio. It's a spiral. The hair on the back of a man's head is spiraled out like the Fibonacci sequence. And I just started going through things. I said, the ratio is in your hand measurements. The ratio is everywhere, even DNA. DNA. And I, I went through the first few numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, and I stopped at 13. I said, the next pattern is 21 and 34. And I said, your DNA in its in its spiral in one helical turn it's 20, 21 angstroms wide and 34 angstroms tall. And he, I could tell he was writing that down. And I said, you go look at that because everything in the creation has that same spiral or that same ratio in it. It's not random. God did that for a reason. And, I, and people, I'll be honest with you, I, 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 I think that we have an outstanding witnessing tool to be able to show people, I did this I did this a few weeks ago with a guy I was sitting in his office. And I could tell he had a church background. I could tell it because he told me he had a church background. And he talked for a while, and I said, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to take about five minutes. Can I show you this? And he said, yeah. And I started showing him the book of DNA and how it was made with the two strands, Old and New Testament, and the four base pairs joining them together. His, I mean, his jaw was – his eyes were this big around – and I'm telling you, people, learn a little bit about this stuff and then go tell people. Go tell people. You don't know, but what you may be able to open somebody's eyes and at least give them a hunger for the Word of God so that they'll go back and sample it themselves. It's like your grandma cooking a dish and you want your best friend to try it. You've got to try that. I don't want to eat your grandma's cooking until grandma comes by waving it in his face, and he's going, oh, that smells good. <gasps> Can I have some of that? Why, sure. She gives him a sample of it, and he's going, oh, will you be my grandma? You know what happens? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I, people... I'm going to be nice about this. Some of the stuff you're posting in the World Wide Web, it's a lie. It's not true. You're wasting your time. Give them things that will make them stand in awe and reverence to the Word of God because most people in their minds think the Bible is just a book written by men. If you can show them that it's actually written by God and that there's no way that 40 different men living in different ages could collate this book and make it appear how it appears, let God do the rest, okay? I got to get to this, okay? Got to get to this. Here's where I'm going with this. These 22 amino acids are like letters. Let's say that this zadi here corresponds with valine. And let's say that this glutamine, L-glutamine, corresponds to peh or cough 
or sheen. Okay, let's say that it does. I don't know that it does, but let's say it does. So you see the connection here. Do you know how each one of these amino acids are made? They're made by a, by a certain known process in the cells, in the genetics, in the, in the mechanics of making amino acids. Remember, you have, your, you have your two strand DNA, you have the four base pairs, okay? And you'll have adenine here, which means you have to have thymine here. That's the rules, guanine, cytosine. So let's say that the scientist is looking at a string of adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and then they have another guanine here and a cytosine here and so on. He's looking at that string. And he knows because he's learned the alphabet of DNA. He knows how he knows what the amino acids are made of. He'll see adenine and thymine and guanine. He'll see three of them together. And he knows that that exact order, adenine, thymine, guanine, he knows that ATG make a certain of the 22 amino acids. That's what he knows because he's got it. He's like read the textbook. He's got a, he's got a, one of those slide rules and he's memorized all this stuff. He knows that ATG makes whatever amino acid. You see what I'm doing here? How many fingers have I got here? A, T, and G. Because let me show you this, okay? Every amino, every one of the 22 amino acids is made up of three nucleotide bases. Adenine, thymine, and guanine make an amino acid, which is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And then another three-lettered pairing, nucleotide, Cytosine, thymine, adenine make another amino acid, which would equate whatever this Hebrew letter is. I had no idea what it is. And then guanine, guanine, cytosine would code for another amino acid, which corresponds to whatever this one is. I think it's Tav. See, that, see it here? Nop, or excuse me, a bowl. Nop, flour. Bowl, not flour. Bowl, not flour. You know what's encoded into the design of the menorah? The exact process and the exact pattern of how the amino acids, the 22 amino acids, are formed in your DNA to make the the genes that make I, and if you haven't seen the Watchman video broadcast DNA in the body of Christ, I I talked about me. I talked about my body makes insulin, not much anymore. I, it needs help. There is a chemical process, a machine that does nothing but go and read DNA strands, and once it gets to the strand that makes insulin. It'll copy that strand. That's called DNA transcription. That's what Ezra, the faithful scribe, did. He transcribed the old book so he could preserve the copy. It's like what you guys do when you give out Bible tracts. You're not giving them the whole Bible and say, here, read this. You know what you do? You give them portions of the Word of God that are designed to do what? Give them the light so they can see salvation and know that they need Jesus to be their Savior. That's what gospel tracts are. They're only just a few verses of the Word of God that are there to do a specific thing in their life, and that is bring them to Christ. The rest of the Bible then will do what God wants it to do in their life. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what DNA transcription is. So the DNA will transcribe a little piece of, of genetic information, and then a machine called polymerase, DNA or RNA polymerase, will take that little transcript, that little tract, and when it sees what was that uh, what was that amino acid we were talking about? When it sees L-glutamine, when it sees the the um, amino acids that make L-glutamine, it will make some L-glutamine out of some proteins. And then it'll see the, th the three nucleotides that make 
L-valine, and it'll go and make some L-valine. And then when it sees another uh, letter, it'll make another amino acid. And all of a sudden now, it's putting these amino acids together in words. And those words do th what they're intended to do. It's the word of God. And every one of those Hebrew letter amino acids are made up of a bowl, a knop, and a flower. A bowl, a knop, and a flower. They're made, these these. Bowls and knops and flowers represent the three nucleotide bases that make the letter amino acids of your DNA. People, and and that's what the guy the guy sent me and said, uh, Pastor, there's like 22 bowls on there, 22 is the number for Revelation. And I went, Oh, I remembered that. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. I'm walking through the I'm walking through J.C. Penny with my wife, and I'm thinking, and she she knows me. She knows that when my eyes are darting back and forth, I'm not having an epileptic seizure. She knows. See, when the eyes move, you're thinking things. And you know what you're doing? You're, you're pulling files and card indexes out, and you're looking at them in your mind, and you're going, wait a minute. If I look this over here and like this here, like they go together. That's how your brain works. Your eyes always reflect what's going on in your brain. And she sees my eyes moving around like this. I'm looking at the floor so as not to be distracted by anything. And I'm just going, she don't even ask anymore. Sometimes she'll go, okay, what is it? But she knows, she knows I'm thinking something. And it occurred to me right there in J.C. Penney that that bowl and that knop and that flower represent the three nucleotides that make up a Hebrew letter amino acid. And I'm just going, God, you are so good. God, you're so wise. God, you have, you have everything in order laid out for your people. You love us. You care about us. You were so thoughtful and so powerful that you preserved your word, your magnificent word. You transcripted it faithfully, and then you translated it faithfully so that old goats like us who live in this so vile, nasty, wicked world we look at that book and we just tear up and our, we just stand in awe and reverence to what's in your word. God's good, people. God's good. I've been telling you that I'm uh, reading a book on, on the cell and on DNA and things like that. And, it, and it's, you want to know the title of the book is called Signature in the Cell. And you can get a copy. You can, I think you can get it from Amazon.com. You can get a, probably a digital copy of it somewhere. Um, it, it's just an amazing book. And just take what you're learning and see if it has an application to what's in the Word of God. I guarantee you it will. Okay? I guarantee you it will. Um, I, that's, I'm going to leave you with that. I'm just going to bow out here. And um, I appreciate uh, everybody praying for me. We're going to try to get this online on Tuesday. And um, by the time you hear this, um, the next day I will be having surgery on my mid-thoracic spine uh, if, if they determine that that's going to do me some good. And so anyway, it's not something I take lightly, and I would ask for your prayers and prayers for me and prayers for my family and prayers for our church. Because when the, when the shepherd's away, um, the devil comes in, tries to tear the sheep up. Okay, so And while I'm weak and things like that, that's when the devil likes to come in and play little games with everybody. So I'm just asking that your prayers, um, that your, that your prayers would be with us. And um, as soon as, uh-oh, did something wrong here. Hang on, hang on. It's a little premature. As soon, I mean as soon 
As I get back on my feet and, and am able, I'll be back doing Watchmen video broadcasts and Pastor Mike on lines and Pure Bible Study. I've got an idea for your Pure Bible Study. You're going to meld it together with Watchmen again because it's pretty cool. All right. Anyway, God bless you. It's good to be with you today. Um, the Lord bless you. I already said that. Anyway, I'm trying to close out of here, trying to think of things, eh? but I'm just going to get out of here. Just remember something. Think Bible. <laughs>